Okay, live streams running. Sergeants, please start your recordings. Computer recording started. Cloud recording is rolling. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Leonardo, please do your opening. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committee on Youth Services. At this time, we ask that all council members and council staff please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruption, please place cell phones and electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you have testimony you wish to submit, you may do so via email at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. We thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. I want to thank you for joining our virtual hearing today on this very important issue, runaway and homeless youth legislation, the reporting and implementation um, follow up. Um, good afternoon. My name is Debbie Rose and I'm the chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Youth Services. Today, the Committee on Youth Services is conducting an oversight hearing on runaway and homeless youth legislation the reporting and implementation. We will focus on four key local laws that address services for runaway and homeless youth. Local law 79 of 2018, local law 81 of 2018, local law 86 of 2018, and local law four of 2019, and the reports that were produced by the Department of Youth and Community Development or DYCD in compliance with these laws. Runaway and homeless youth remain one of the city's most vulnerable populations. In recent years, both state and local law have evolved to better address the unique challenges faced by this demographic through efforts such as increased funding, extending the amount of time youth may remain in a shelter and expanding services to include homeless young adults up to the age of 24 years old. The reporting legislation at the center of today's hearing reflect these efforts to expand access and enhance services for runaway and homeless youth. Local law 79 requires that DYCD to regularly report on runaway and homeless youth shelter access. Local law 81 addresses the transition from DYCD funded services to the Department of Homeless Services and how the process is accomplished and the number of youth referred Local law 86 requires DYCD to capture a capacity plan to provide shelter to all runaway and homeless youth and to regularly report on the size, demographic, the service needs and outcomes for youth when they exit DYCD programs. And local law four requires that DYCD to establish a plan to provide information on immigration relief and benefit services for undocumented youth and regularly report on the plan's progress and goals. Thanks to DYCD's timely compliance with these reporting requirements, we have accumulated years of data on run runaway and homeless youth and their related services. However, for the purposes of this hearing, adherence to the law is only the tip of the iceberg. Today, this committee's primary objective is to examine if and how the reported data is accomplishing its intended goal, to, which is to improve access, services, and outcomes for runaway and homeless youth. At today's hearing, we shall investigate the data's accuracy inquire into any trends represented in the reports, elicit testimony as to how the department, providers, and advocates have utilized the collected information and consider recommendations on how to better implement these laws. In closing, we are here today to go beyond the bureaucracy and ensure that our laws are still working for the betterment 
of our most vulnerable youth. I want to take this moment to thank the staff behind the scenes who make this online hearing run smoothly. And I'd like to thank the Youth Committee staff for their work on this issue. Committee Counsel Amy Briggs, Committee Policy Analyst Anastasia Zamina, and the Financial Analyst Michelle Peregrine. And I want to give a big thanks to my staff as well, Legislative Director Issa Cortez, and Legislative Aid and Budget Director Christian Ravello. I'd like to, at this moment, acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us for this very important hearing. Um, uh, I'm glad to welcome and uh, see Council Member Riley, Council Member Lewis, and Council Member Chin. Thank you for attending today. And now I will turn over to the committee council, who is Amy Briggs who will review some procedural items relating to today's hearing. Thank you, Chair Rose. I'm Amy Briggs, Counsel to the Committee on Youth Services of the New York City Council, and I'll be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you're called, you'll be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce who the next panelists will be. Council member questions will be limited to five minutes. And council members, please note that this includes both your questions and the witnesses' answers. Please also note that we will allow a second round of questions at today's hearing, and these will be limited to two minutes, again, including both your questions and the witnesses' answer. For public testimony, I will call up individuals in panels. Council members who have questions for particular panelists should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Randy Scott, who is the DYCD Assistant Commissioner for Vulnerable and Special Needs Youth Division, and Tracy Thorne, RHY Director. I will, administer, I will now administer the oath to the both of you. And after reading the oath, I will call upon you individually by name to respond to the oath at, one at a time. So please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth before the, the, this committee and to respond on, honestly to council member questions. Assistant Commissioner Randy Scott. I will. Thank you. And Director Tracy Thorne. I will. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Scott, you may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair Rose and members of the Youth Services Committee. I am Randy A. Scott, Assistant Commissioner for Vulnerable and Special Needs Youth at the Department of Youth and Community Development. My pronouns are he, him. I am joined by Tracy Thorne, she, her, Director of Runaway and Homeless Youth Programs. On behalf of Commissioner Chong, thank you for this opportunity to update the council on our compliance with various pieces of legislation impacting runaway and homeless youth services. 2018 was a watershed moment for this committee and the council in passing important bills concerning DYCD's portfolio of RHY services. They enshrine into law the work of the de Blasio administration and the council to strengthen the runaway and homeless youth system. Nonprofit RHY providers and advocates in the city have been unwavering in their commitment and are the unsung sheroes and heroes of this important work which will improve the lives of young people for years to come. To name a few of our major accomplishments, we have more than tripled the number of residential beds, increased the age for residential services to 24, and opened new drop-in centers. There are currently eight DYCD funded centers to with at least one 24 seven center operating in all of the five boroughs. Young people can now access high quality mental health services in drop-in centers, and in residences. Finally, initiated by the New York City Unity Project, 
we expanded resources to address the unique and often unmet needs of LGBTQ plus youth. Our system is unparalleled and demonstrates the city as a national leader in fighting homelessness, youth homelessness, and ensuring better outcomes for young people. It could not have come at a more critical time as the city contended with COVID-19. In recognition of that, HUD recently awarded New York City a $15 million um, dollar grant as part of the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program, YHDP. This funding from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, will support a wide range of new housing and service interventions to prevent and end youth home homelessness. We look forward to engaging with stakeholders across all sectors, particu particularly the young people who, with, whose lived experience will add a critical voice to the work. Highlights of recent RHY legislation include Local Law 79, tracking youth unable to access services. Local Law 86, better understanding the needs of young people through demographic data analysis. Local Law 87, extending the time young people can stay in RHY residences. Local Law 88, increasing the age to 24 for some crisis services and TIL programs. Local Law 174, a centralized complaint process. Local Law 81, streamlining the process for youth to enter the adult system and tracking situations where a youth experience barriers accessing DYCD's residential programs. And local law four. Finally, in 2019, the council passed legislation supporting immigration relief and benefits. In all these areas, we have made significant process that I will highlight for you now. In 2019, RHY was integrated into DYCD Connect, DYCD's data and communication tracking system. DYCD Connect has features to better track RHY, including utilization, discharge reports, demographics, and program outcomes. RHY and provider staff can utilize, utilize uh, track and monitor the progress of young people across the system to better meet their needs. DYCD Connect allowed RHY to reduce emails and spreadsheets to a streamlined data system. This has made information required by the council's legislation more easily accessible. As previously highlighted, we implemented two key program policies, increasing the time young people may stay in residential programs up to 120 days in crisis services programs and 24 months in transitional independent living programs. Following these state and city legislative changes, we also created residential services for youth up to the age of 24. And now, and we now have four programs with a total of 60 beds for homeless young adults. We work closely with providers so that every young person who wants a place to stay can get one. Last fiscal year, including the peak of the pandemic, 3,455 youth were placed in a crisis services or transitional independent living program. During the same period, in response to local law 79, no young person was reported to be declined or referral to service. Also reported during that period through the streamlined process under local law 81, 69 young people were referred to the adult system. To better understand the needs of youth, we collect and report on details of the size and characteristics of RHY, including gender identity, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, ethnicity <laughs> pro pregnancy and parenting status and disabilities. We look at their service needs in areas such as educational assistance, high school proficiency preparation, medical services, mental health services, services for sexually exploited children, and temporary shelter. And we carefully monitor the dispositions of runaway and homeless youth who exit the program. We have a system to allow young people to voice their concerns through the ombudsman person. And we have displayed insights across the system, posters detailing how young people can anonymously and confidentially ask questions, comment, and complain about RHY services through 311 and Community Connect, formerly known as Youth Connect. Finally, working with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, we created information guides 
and facilitated meetings in collaboration with Moya to inform youth in need of immigration related services, including legal help and other services, how to access available, available city services and resources. RHW providers give participants information about services and resources related to immigration, including immigration related legal services. This approach ensures that youth who may need the information will have it, whether or not they have asked for it. With October being Mental Health Awareness Month, we wanted to share with you this um, exciting news. Starting November 1st, 2021, our drop-in centers will be mental health wellness hubs. They will administer behavioral assessments and provide therapy across all RHY programs with the goal of closing service gaps for vulnerable youth. These are just a few examples of how we fulfilled the letter and spirit of the laws passed by the council. With November marking National Runaway Prevention Month and National Homeless Youth Awareness Month, we look forward to continuing to work with you, advocates, providers, and youth in the time ahead to continue to improve services for you. We are pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I will now turn to Chair Rose for any questions. Thank you so much, Assistant Commissioner Scott um, and uh, Director Thorne. Uh, it's good to see you. Good. To see I, you. Uh, good. Um, I'd like to uh, address first Local Law 79. As you know, it was enacted in 2008. And it requires that DYCD um, report every six months beginning in 2018. And I really want to thank you for your timely submission of these reports. You're very welcome. <laughs> I, I, I know sometimes we beat up on you about, you know, reports, but um, I, I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, you understand the importance of these reports and have, have complied. Uh, and I really appreciate that. Um, and so it's a report of every six months of RHY who request shelter and unable to access shelter services. The report is required to include a total number of young people uh, eligible for this department funded program disaggregated by the following. The type of shelter services the youth um, who were um, attempting to obtain, including if it was a crisis services program or a transitional independent living support program or a TIL, the name of the runaway and homeless program where the youth did not access shelter services, the bed capacity at the program, the number of beds available at the time the youth did not access shelter services, the age of youth who did not access shelter services. Um, if such information was volunteered, the sexual orientation and gender identity of the youth. And finally, the reason why youth did not access shelter services, including if the youth was offered a bed and declined and the reason why. Um, the advocates and providers uh, called our attention to DYCD's um, uh, failure to capture in its shelter access reports, youth who attempt to access a bed on their own as well as youth who are being referred by a non-DYCD source, such as a teacher who might be looking for a bed for a homeless student, um, uh, which could lead to the undercounting of youth who have sought a shelter bed. Um, could you tell me um, why, uh, you know, um, why is DYCD only tracking referrals made by other DYCD programs? And do you capture youth who call on their own um, in search of a shelter bed? And if so, how? If not, why? Um, what about um, a, DC, uh, a DYCD referrer such as a DOE? Mm -hmm. The information that's provided to us comes directly from our um, contracted providers. So in, in order for us to report um, information on Local Law 79, we would need to get the information from the providers. 
So if a representative from DOE contacted the provider to um, look to make a placement, and if there was no placement, then that provider would, would document that. If there is a placement, then there would be no need to document um, a turnaway for, for any particular youth. And at this present time, just to put it on record, we are averaging 25, we're utilizing 75% of the beds and 25 are vacant. So there is availability for youth within the um, contracted um, system. So presently, no youth should be turned away with that um, amount of beds um, being available. So the, the goal is, is that if the, it has been communicated how folks can go about um, identifying beds. They can call the provider directly, right? Or they can come through DYCD and then we um, work with them to make a placement, which we have done in the past when some of our sister agencies have called us or even a state agency has called us or a provider or an advocate have called in regards to um, a, a, a placement of a particular youth. And we've made sure that that placement has happened due to the fact that there are vacant beds in the um, currently. Um, and when they, uh, they call you or go through DYCD, is that information captured where and where? Well, usually we, um, we have an email. If it's an email thread, um, then we have the email as um, documentation. If it's not a, a, a email, or if it's a phone call, then basically what we may do in that particular instance is provide them with the um, contact information for the provider where they can make the necessary placement. And then once they contact that provider, then the provider would intake um, that youth into um, their into their program. And then through our PTS system, which is the participant tracking system, we can see that referral um, and that intake happen. And then that information is captured in the report? Yes, that would, um, well, not in this report, because this report is only for turnaways. In that particular situation, if there's a vacancy and then um, a referral is made and the youth is intaked into the program, they would not have been turned away. So they would not show up on this report. So um, there have been no turnaways that um, have come through DY through DYCD. For the last few reports, I think I want to say the last two reports, there have been zero due to vacancies, and we've had vacancies um, throughout the contracted system. So, in reality, there should be no turnaway when you have um, vacant beds. So. Um, if, uh, if we only require that, you know, um, the, the necessary reference, you know, referrers uh, uh, are giving um, information for the shelter access reports, would accuracy be increased by collecting relevant information from all of the links in the referral process? Wouldn't it be a little more accurate in terms of numbers? Well, in, in regards to, and this is where this report is very um, important for the providers, because all of the information that is um, given to us comes from them. So if a, a, a entity that is not contracted through us is in need of a bed and contacts the um, provider, then we would um, hope that they would import, um, report that information. We can't, we don't know who's calling um, the providers for particular placements. So we require them to make sure that they submit that information. And one of the things that we do with respect to this report is when we get our reports from the providers on whether or not someone was turned away or if they report zero, we confirm that. You know, We confirm that via emails with the providers. So for example, if you Councilwoman Rose sent me a uh, report that said you had zero turnaways for that given period. I would write back an email to you saying, um, so Councilwoman Rose, what you're saying is that you have zero turnaways for this month. And then you would write back to me, yes, that is confirmed. Or if something was incorrect, then you would resubmit your report with the, um, with the corrected information. So we have that monitoring and that um, checks and balances to make sure that what we report to you 
during the period for local law 79 is accurate. Okay. Um, I guess what I'm, I'm also trying to find out, is there any way to, to capture the data of young people who might have tried to access the system through other means? Um, is there any way to capture that? Well, I guess I'm, I'm, the difficulty in the question is if they're trying to access our system, then that means that we would know about it because the provider would report it, right? right. So they, they would report it into our system. Now, if our system is only for our contracted providers, so and the report only reflects our contracted providers, it doesn't extend outwards because of the the, um, the nature of them having access to our systems, which they don't. So that's why we have to rely heavily on our providers to report everything, even those that may come from um, um, other, you know, providers, sources. other sources outside of our system. Mm -hmm. And that's why we do that double check with them to make sure that, all right, are you saying you had zero? So you're telling me now that no outside source wanted to do a placement and you turn that source away. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. We have zero. Or if they needed to change, then they changed. And and uh, I, I know you said it, but um, just for me, um, once again, those um, young people who find their way through DYCD to to make that call and and ask for that referral, um, how are they captured if they're not? If, if they're turned away, mm -hmm. how, how do we capture them? Yeah, if, if a youth goes directly to one of our contracted programs, so say, for example, they go directly to a crisis services program, and that crisis services turns them away because they have no bed, then they need to um, account for them in this local law 79 report. However, there are steps that need to be taken prior to turning a youth away at our um, contracted providers. And those steps are when a youth comes in, if directly off a referral comes in, they need to one, check our system to make sure that there are no available beds and that they're not just saying that. So they need to confirm that. Two, they need to pick up the phone and call the various residential programs that they're looking to make that referral based on gender and things of that nature um, to confirm that what they're seeing in the system is accurate. Right, because sometimes you, you may see a, a two beds vacant in the system, but that provider may have identified youth young person to fill those beds already. So you wanna make sure that that vacancy is an accurate vacancy. Three, if a provider tells you, oh, sorry, we do not have any vacancies, then you need to get DYCD involved, right? Because maybe you know they're holding the bed or whatever the case may be. And we wanna know what the justification for that is. So once you've um, done that and then you've gotten DYCD involved and we've confirmed and made sure, then we make sure that there's a placement for that particular youth. For example, if we know we have a youth on site at the moment, that youth will get the bed. And the youth that who the bed was identified for and who may be coming later, when that person eventually arrives, then we work with that particular youth to make sure that they get a bed. So there is a system in place of how we go about guaranteeing um, placement of youth into the beds, um, which goes as far as checking system, um, calling the provider as well. And the last step is contacting us so that we can work with you to make that placement. Um, does DYCD track bed vac vacancies in the system based on gender or specialized populations, LGBTQ, C, SEC, kosher, mother, child. Um, yes, we do. Uh, okay. If you do? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And that that process takes place at what? Initial? Well, each, in, within our system, each of our providers can also see what bed is available and for what um, gender. So if it's a male identified program, they won't be able to see that. If it's a female identified program, they'll be able to see that. If it's a program that um, specializes with LGBTQ plus young people, they will see that. They will also see our mother child 
and so on. So that is available and um, seeable to not only us, but to our providers. Um, what's DYCD's definition of a vacant bed? For instance, if a bed is vacant on a Monday night, but a youth is scheduled to move into it on Tuesday morning, is that bed classified or counted as vacant? Uh, what, how would it be classified? Yes, a bed system? is vacant until a, a youth is intake into that bed, right? If, for example, like I had um, just explained, if a youth was identified, so if Randy was identified for a bed, but Randy was not uh, on site already, and Councilwoman Rose has a particular youth in her um, person and is ready to come there right now and is gonna be put in a cab or whatever the case may be, then that person will get the bed. And then when Randy um, arrived at that site, if the program did not have an additional vacant bed, then we would look to make sure that we find a placement for that youth, um, knowing that that bed was given to the youth that was already on site. The goal is not to have a, a youth leave and come back. So we work with those, the programs are supposed to work with those who are in their person first, and then those that come um, afterwards, we'll work with them once they um, arrive on site. Okay. And then every measure is made to ensure that that youth gets a bed. Yep. In, and as a an appropriate and that, yeah. placement and an appropriate placement. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, when DYCD generates shelter access reports, does it cross reference youth that are trying to get a bed against all of the vacant beds or only against the vacant beds for which the youth is eligible? I just asked you that, right? <laughs> for instance, <laughs> um, yeah, like, well, maybe like a cisgendered male, would he be cross? Would they be cross referenced against all of the vacant beds in the system, uh, including those for LGBTQ youth and mother and child, or only against those that would be available to him as a single cisgendered male? The, the goal is to place the youth um, based on their gender. Um, however, if, for example, all beds are full, and there is a facility that has a single bed because we wouldn't put a male and a female in the same um, room. That is not allowed. Um, but if there's a single bed available, what we would do so that that youth does not get turned away is place them in that single room um, with the necessary safety precautions um, and monitoring. And then the next day, if it happens overnight or as soon as a bed opens up, then the placement would be made for the right um, classification. Yeah. Um, is there um, a, a working group that uh, works together to improve the shelter access reporting, um, uh, reporting uh, bill, uh, not bill, but the, the reporting actually. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if not, why, why have we not established a working group that includes providers and advocates? Mm -hmm. Well, we, as you know, we hold um, regular provider meetings. And within those provider meetings, we talk about an array of issues that um, impact the services that are being rendered by the providers. Shelter access has been a, a topic of discussion um, in terms of the reporting of it in terms of the systems of how to go about tracking the systems of how about making placements so at those meetings at a time when we can discuss any evolution to um services and um its delivery so i think we i would classify that as a working group since that's something that's um we do on a regular and we talk about the issues that um the providers deal with on a daily basis as well as the young people okay um, we've had, you know, um, um, the providers and advocates have requested a, a working group to specifically address that, and um, and we've sort of revisit we visited this issue of um, a more hands on interaction and and cooperation with the providers and advocates at our last hearing um, mm -hmm. when we talked about. Um, oh, it just left my head. Um, youth count. Oh, staff group, youth count. Thank you, youth count. We talked about the youth count. 
And um, and despite the agencies, DYCDs, you know, um, conversation that there it does sort of exist. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a lot of pushback at that hearing about mm -hmm. that that does not really meet their needs and and in reality it, it, it isn't what you know they're looking for and so um i i can't help but think that you know um our definite you know there's some difference in the definition or or what people are looking for in terms of working groups you mm -hmm. know working collaboratively for you know um and and having actual input uh into these you know systems processes reports so um you know like what are we going to do to actually you know bring them in and and let them be a, a part of it um and not um just maybe um a passing agenda item that's covered in a in a, a more global meeting um it, what what are, what are we going to do? What can we do about that? Because you know this seems to be a recurring yeah. sort of. So, so I guess I guess to to add more context to the, the, the discussion is, with respect to our um, providers, we outside our monthly meetings are not the only communication that we have with them. We have communication with them on a daily basis. As you know, we do site visits on a monthly basis to all of our provider sites. And we, um, in the exit interviews, um, in the discussion with them, we talk about things that they want to, um, you know, to discuss or agenda items that they want more context on or more information or a full discussion on. So that is always available and we can always create a space to discuss if it, if that's um, the direction. But as you know, there's a lot of things happening in RHY um, right now, and the, the focus has been on the vouchers, right? So we have a working group for the vouchers because that's the, that's what the providers have informed us is their top um, item. So the same way we've had that voucher, um, EHV voucher work group going on, the City for Heps work voucher um, work group going on, we can have um, shelter access if that's what the providers want to utilize their time for. With respect to the advocates, we've always had communication with the advocates. You know, um, we've worked with legal aid. We've worked with Jamie and her coalition um, on different things. So DYCD is not running from any discussion um, on any particular issue. If that's the issue that is identified by our contracted providers as the most important thing for them to meet with us on, then we will definitely do that. Um, however, we've been told right now, the most important thing are these vouchers, right? The housing vouchers. So that's where we are with respect to the um, bringing in of everyone, all the stakeholders for particular things. So, um, you know, we are ready. If that's what they want to talk about is shelter access and improving it from what it looks like now, that's great. But we haven't heard that from our contractor providers as their top item. And these are things that we discuss with them on a regular basis as to what we need to talk about in our provider meetings. And the agendas are usually driven by that. But we're open to any communication that needs to happen on any of these local laws. Because, of, I, because, because they all come from their providers. So basically, you know, they need to so they drive the um, communication. Okay, well, um, I mean, that's that's good to hear, but um, you know, they've said to me uh, on numerous occasions that they have. So I, I understand that you have, you know, um, sort of ongoing conversations about um, these issues, um, but we we know that things don't really sort of happen until that formal meeting where it is the agenda item and you know we have you know some goals set and you know a timeline and mm -hmm. you know a more structured conversation be, besides you know like i'm having this issue regarding blah 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 uh, you know a phone call that that transpires so mm -hmm. um 
one thing I can one thing I can add is that for every local law that we are responsible for reporting to to council, we have had um, meetings with our contracted providers on each of them to one explain their role, explain the process, explain our reporting, and the timelines. And we, it wasn't just one meeting; it was a few meetings where until we knew that everyone was clear on what needed to um to happen. And we're at a place right now where our system is working very well in terms of how we report. And that's why we're able to get the reports to you in a timely way, because of the fact that our providers are doing a great job in reporting the, um, what they're seeing on the ground with respect to the youth. So, you know, again, we are open to any communication with um, providers and um, advocates as we have always been doing in terms of making sure the services and systems operate um, effectively. Oh, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. And um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, they're going to follow up. But just like the purpose of these reports are for us to collect the data mm -hmm. and to assess it and, mm -hmm. and to review it, you know, it's an ongoing process to see what needs to be done or if there's any changes that need to be made. Um, that's the purpose of these reports, right? Correct. Um, so, so should maybe the process with the conversations about the providers and the advocates about, you know, like, okay, you know, at this point, this was good, this was working, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. But now we find that, you know, we're into this report, you know, for two years or whatever, and we find that we need to maybe uh, on the, after assessing it, we need to do X, Y, and Z. So I'm saying that there, there might be a need, there, there's a need to come back and, and engage them again. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm, we are very open to that, but we're also okay. happy to, to keep reporting that there's zero turn away. So that's a great. Okay. Thing. No, that's, that's fine. And I'm, 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 I'm pleased to hear that. Um, and, and we wouldn't have known that if we didn't have the report. So I, I thank you. Um, in, in relation to local law 81, um, it's a biannual reporting bill, um, you know, uh, that um, in addition to its reporting requirements, this law also requires coordination between DYCD and the Department of Homeless Services to streamline the transition to DHS shelters of um, home, runaway and homeless youth who have reached the age and or time limitations. Um, and so uh, I, I know this is a hot item that we're, we're looking at. Um, I want to know why are the youth in our DYCD drop-in centers not allowed to be referred for placement in the DHS system using the streamlined process that would allow them to bypass the DHS intake and assessment um, facilities. The, the, Please give me a really detailed answer because this mm -hmm. seems well. To be basically, a the the decision is on DHS. They decide decide um, who this process was for, and it was identified for the residential programs. We have had discussions with DHS on including. Um, drop-in centers and that discussion is ongoing. So we're hoping to get um, to some closure with respect to that where our drop-in centers can can um, be part of this this local law. This local yeah, law you, you do see the need for you do see the need for a streamlined process, right? Um, and you, you are planning to streamline the process to incorporate the drop-in centers, right? Well the the, the we were the ones that um, ask for the, the meeting to include our drop-in center. So we are hoping that through continuous discussions with our um, our partners over at DHS, we'll be able to get to some closure on that and include our drop-in centers. Commissioner However, Scott, you, you've been with me long enough to know <laughs> that my next question is once we say we're gonna do it, it's like when, is yeah. like, is there a timeline? Do we have, we already established how you know we're going to get this or facilitate this happening you know um if we're saying uh, that there's a need and that we're looking at it 
you know, what are we doing to, to implement it, to get it to the point where it's, it becomes the reality? Well, we, we, we were, I know, I know you are, I know you are. And, and just to say, I, I don't want you to think that we haven't done anything. We've had a series of, we've had a series, okay, I know. We, we've had a series of meetings with them. So now they are taking back the information that we've provided with to them in regards to why this would be a benefit and they're discussing it internally. So we're just waiting to hear back from them with respect to that. Um, and, you know, we can, we're definitely going to check in with them um, on that process to see where we are. But we've had um, meetings with them on it and provided them with um, with information. Okay, um, you have council support to make this happen. Okay. So um, I, I really appreciate would that. like to see that. You know, I'd like to see that go forward. Um, and in relation to local law eighty eight. Um, which also has a reporting requirement. While Runaway and Homeless Youth Act was um, amended to permit RHY shelters to extend their services to homeless young adults, Local Law 88 authorizes DYCD to limit such services at its discretion. The law provides that DYCD shall include shelter services for homeless young adults as part of RHY services, but not but need not serve all such adults. If youth are in fact not being turned away due to insufficient bed capacity, why won't DYCD allow programs with contracts for 16 to 20 year olds to serve older 21 to 24 year old youth? And if there are vacant beds in these programs, um, and this is something that the providers and advocates have requested. Well, as you know, um, there, there are two separate resources. There's resources for the 16 to 20, which are the 753 beds. And then there's resources for the 21 and 24, which are the new investment of the 60 mm -hmm. beds. Um, there is still a need, according to um, you know, providers and advocates for beds for 16 to 20. If we should happen to take those resources away and give them to the 21 to 24, then we are now um, creating a, a, a system where there won't be any resources for the 16 to 20. So we've always said that it should be dedicated resources for 16 to 20 and for 21 to 24. And but if we're you know, not if we're not turning away any 16 to 20s, correct, but um, I, I, as according to the, the reports, right? Mm -hmm. Um then there, there's I, also there's also some other means. For example, you wanna for the 16 to 20, it's you you don't want to put the the 22 to 24s with that population because they're impressionable. So you want to make sure that they have the necessary resources dedicated solely to them. And then with the fact that there is um, the right to shelter for the older population, we, there's always the um, availability of a referral through the streamline or other um, po possibilities for the older population. So you really don't wanna take away from the 16 to 20 when the 18 and above have um, the re uh, right to shelter. So, you know. so that would sort of indicate to me then that there is a need for more um, 21 to 24 year old beds. And um, is DYCD advocating, you know, for more funding to bring, you know, more 21 to 24 um, year old beds online, mm -hmm. uh, especially for fiscal year 23, since um, there seems to be the need is there. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we're still doing our um, analysis because as I stated earlier, there is a, a right to shelter for 18 and above. So they have, um, you know, the DHS the adult system to be referred to for that population. So we are currently just continuing to assess the, the trends and the needs and then uh, make any necessary um, internal decisions. But right now, the the need is being addressed for but both the need 16 is being addressed um, in the DHS um, system. 
mm -hmm. not our system. Our, well, our, well where, and, and I guess and we, we, we deliberately wanted to allow them, right? Mm -hmm. to, so, but then, you, then you're playing, I guess there has to be the discussion of right to shelter, right? The right to shelter is being placed not only in DYCD or DHS, it's being placed in appropriate um, placement. And with DHS being a um, bigger um, system, having more availability, they are the youth who are 21 to 24 are being um, or have the ability to be placed. So, you know, it was an investment that was made. And I guess, you know, through discussions, through review, through analysis, um, through the advocates doing what they do best, if there is invest more investment in given to us for our um, creation of new beds under DOICD, then I guess that will be something that will be discussed at that time. But right now, the availability of referrals, the availability of receiving a bed is available for both 16 to 20, as well as 21 to 24, whether it's DYCD or DHS. So, um, so the fact that we identified that there was a need for this specialized, you know, this for, um, for shelter for this group outside of the broader DHS system, um, why would we not? Why would we not pursue more beds and um, as a part of our system instead of putting them into you know a system that we already realized that you, you know that we needed to to sort of segregate them out of that system. I, I, I don't understand if, if we know that there's a need for more 2124 beds, um, we, we, why aren't we pursuing that? We should be pursuing it. We know that there's, there, there's sort of like, they have um, a safety net because they can go into um, DHS, you know, adult shelters. But that's not really that wasn't really our goal, right? Mm -hmm. like we were we were trying not to put them into mm -hmm. DHS shelters. So I, I, I guess I guess it goes back to when you say um, the need. The need I think can be addressed, and I think DHS can address the need for twenty one to twenty four. Now, if you're looking for specialized beds solely under DYCD, then I think that's another discussion to be had. But when the, when the question that you ask is whether there's whether the need is being met, I think we can say that there are beds available for that population um, within the city. Now, to have additional beds under um, DYCD, if an invest if the investment is um, given to us, we're going to do our best to put those beds online, similar to how we did for the four programs that are currently online, so. So my question was, is DYCD advocating for more funding to bring additional 21 to 24 year old beds online? So it sounds to me that no, it is not because- I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. You're saying that they have, you know, because of the right to shelter, that there's a bed for them in DHS. Mm -hmm. And so, my, so it sounds to me as if no, you're not. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I'm saying based on the 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 the, the reports that we have, mm -hmm. there's clearly a need for that in our system. Well, our beds are, are, are fairly new, and I wouldn't say that we're we're saying there's no need for it. We we're not saying that. What we're saying is that we're currently doing an analysis of our beds. They were brand new, just came online. The last program just came on March of um, 20, March of 2021. So we still need to be able to do our re review and analysis of these beds to see how often they turn over, see how many youth are being, um, youth and young people are being um, intaked, how many are receiving services for particular um, issues. And then we will be able to answer your question to say, what have we um, identified or you know, done analysis on that shows whether there's a need or not. So I would ask for 
a little bit of time for us to be able to do that, knowing that our beds are new in terms of being online. But in the interim, so, if, there, if a youth should come and there is no available bed within the four programs that we have, then we'd make the necessary referral to our um, sister agency, DHS. So you're saying that right now we're not turning away or sending to DHS any 21 to 24 year olds? I'm not, I'm not saying that. If our 60 beds are full and then a youth should identify at one of the contracted uh, programs that are 21 to 24 and is in need of a bed, that necessary referral is done to our um, sister agency. So yes, we, we right. guarantee so, that no youth is turned away and no youth is um, without placement. So I had hoped that um, during my tenure as, uh, as the chair of the youth committee, um, it, there seems to be like this recurring theme where there's a hesitancy to, um, to ask the, the administration for appropriate funding to meet the needs that you know DYCD has. It just seems to be like a, a reluctance. Um, and and I, I hope that you know going forward that this doesn't carry over. I hope in you know with the, the new administration that um, that DYCD will ask for and advocate for the appropriate funding levels for you know to meet the needs of all of our, our programs. And, and, um, and I, I, I just wanted to add to respond to that. And I think DYCD does do that. Um, when, with respect to requesting um, when needed. But what we do prior to any request is our analysis, because we want to make sure that when we come to you with our request, it's a full request, and it's very detailed in terms of what we want. And a perfect example of that is our mental wellness hubs that we just did for our drop-in centers. We know that mental health is a, a major issue for youth and young people that um, our contracted providers work with. And it was DYCD who initiated that um, request for funding to make our drop in centers mental health wellness hubs. We drafted the proposal. We submitted it to um, the Office of Community and Mental Health. We um, submitted it to OMB to get the um, green light for them to, to fund it. And we got the funding for it based on that analysis that we did prior, as well as putting together a full, fully fleshed out um, proposal that can allow for people to ask less questions of what do you really want. And I think that's what we do with respect to any service that we want to come to city council for, that we want to go to OMB for, or that we want to go to um, city hall for. And that's what we're doing with respect to these new beds that we receive is doing the analysis so that we could put together our concrete proposal of what we need and then come to you or the next um, chair and say, hey, this is what we currently have. This is what the trends are saying. These are what the numbers are saying. This is the dollar amount we want. This is the number of beds that we would like to get an investment for and then see where it goes from there. But I think, and I know you know DYCD as a, a legit agency where we do things um, in a very, um, good way for the youth of New York City. And we wanna make sure that we continue that and making sure that we don't submit things where it's gonna to lead to more questions than less. And that's just how we operate. Right, so um, I'm glad I'm glad to hear that you're gonna do more analysis. So my, my response to that is that yes, I hope that we can establish a timeline for that so that we're ready to um, be a part of the FY23 budget cycle. And, um, and I, can't, I can't help myself. I have to say that no, that's not always been the case. I mean, as we've seen with SYEP and several of the summer programs that the, you know that there's a need and that you know, we haven't always advocated for you know, to, to meet the needs of the program. So, I'm not going to, you know, belabor that point, but um, I really hope that, you know, your analysis is done in time for there to be um, a real discussion during um, the FY23 budget negotiations. 
Um, and then how does DYC determine and decide what outcomes to report on and who determines when any of these reporting metrics are no longer viable to continue or include in your reports? Well, and that's my last question for uh, for you, so my colleagues can ask some questions. <laughs> no problem. Sorry. Um, no problem. But in regards to metrics and outcomes, it's usually it's usually driven by um, laws. It's usually dri driven by any new bills that come. It's also driven by communication with our providers, trends that we're seeing from our analysis um, with respect to um, certain things. So a combination of all of those things drive where we are with respect to what we ask our providers to report on. And it's always usually through a discussion with them on whether or not they can do it. If it's something that's not doable, we are um, okay with you know, coming back to the source that is requesting it and letting them know what is doable so that we can all be on the same page with respect to any outcomes and information that's reported. So that is clean, it's understandable, and that um, even though you don't work for DYCD, you can um, go out there and speak on behalf of it. Okay, thank you. Um, You're welcome. I, I want to um, I, I thank you um, for answering my questions. And um, I'm now going to turn it over to um, the moderator so that my colleagues um, can ask questions. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging council members Eugene and Felice, who had joined us during this hearing earlier. And I will now call on council members in the order in which they have used the raised hand function. Um, council members, please remember to keep your questions to five minutes, including the time for the witness responses. And the surgeon, sergeant at arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. We will now hear questions from council member Luis, Lewis and council member Chin. Um, council member Lewis. Time begins. Fox ready. Thank you, Chair Rose, for holding today's hearing. And thank you, Assistant Commissioner Scott, for joining us today and for sharing information about your agency's process to streamline accessibility to beds um, at drop-in centers. You kind of answered uh, my question, but I have a follow-up to it. Um, the global pandemic has definitely been daunting on all of us, especially our homeless youth and runaways. Um, and I wanted to know if you could just share more information about the mental health services being provided at the mental uh, wellness hubs that you shared earlier. How are you um, or your agency uh, measuring the effectiveness of the mental wellness hubs? And I also wanted to know, because I only have five minutes, I also wanted to know, how is your agency preparing for unaccompanied uh, minors who are refugees from Afghanistan and Haiti and other countries? Um, is there any support that's being provided at drop-in centers for some of these young people. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, with respect to, I'll answer the last question first and then give you some information on the mental health wellness hubs. Um, right now, our services, the only criteria for our services is age. Um, so usually you have to meet the um, age requirement. For our drop-ins, the age is 14 to 24. And for residential, it's 16 to 24. Um, as well, 16 to 20 and, and 21 to 24. So if a, um, you know, a youth, young person should go to any one of those places, they, are, they will receive services. They don't have to have ID currently on them. They don't have to um, you know, provide any specific documents that will allow for them to re receive services at those programs. Once they're in those programs, that's when then the seasoned case uh, management teams at the respective contractor providers would work with that particular youth, young person to get any necessary documents or services um, that they may require. So we've had immigrants within our programs who have come and have no documents and their programs help them to get those things and then utilize the services. So that's basically how that works with respect to um, any service that um, DYCD RHY program offers. So it's only age that's the criteria. With respect to the mental wellness hubs, um, we, we've had an investment with at first Thrive NYC and now the Office of Community Mental Health, I say about the last four to five years. Um, we were that initial group of um, 
um, city agencies that had initiatives. So there were certain metrics. In the beginning, the uh, mental health, well, mental health services were based on helping our providers um, get that diagnosis for our youth to receive housing because they needed a mental health diagnosis. So that was the gist of why we went to get mental health services. But since then we've evolved it where they've done, um, you know, sessions, um, you know, group sessions, they've done um, art therapy, they've done psych um, psychological evaluations, different things like that in order to help the youth get the, continue to get the services. What the mental wellness hubs are gonna do is now give each of our drop-in centers a more a higher credentialed staff person. So a LMSW, a LCSW, a KSAC, in order to deal with the serious mental health issue that they had. Before we got this new investment, they, um, a lot of the providers, if they didn't have a mental health um, component within their um, agency structure, had to refer out. Now they could bring a, a individual staff in who can address that and it cuts down on the time that a youth now has to be referred out, scheduled an appointment and things of that nature. And maybe the youth may not go to that appointment because they may not trust the person that they're being referred to or don't know the person or whatever the case may be. But with this um, drop-ins now being able to hire staff to address these issues, they can handle those SMIs more um, expeditiously and create that plan for that particular youth to get that mental health service. So it's a new uh, initiative that's starting in November, we had our first um, meeting with the drop-ins this week in terms of talking about what things that we're going to look to do. And we're, our goal is basically to try to evolve this, go from how we did with just the seven metrics to now having mental um, wellness hubs to even identifying what additional mental health services are needed, and then going back to the Office of Community Mental Health and seeing if we can get more money. So hopefully that answered your question. It, you did. Uh, look forward to talking to you about that some more offline. Thank you so much, Chair Rose. You're welcome. Thank you, Council Member. We will next hear from Council Member Chen. I begins. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Rose. I'm glad we have this uh, follow up hearing. Um, I wanted to kind of follow up on the on the youth from 21 to 24. Do you keep track? of youth in that age bracket that was referred to DHS? Yes. That's one question. Uh, and right now we only have 60 beds. I just assume that, you know, there is a greater need. And depending on the number uh, of youth in this age group that was referred to DHS, we can see in terms of how many more beds we actually need, right? Mm -hmm. um, Second question is that in this age group, do they, do you prioritize them um, as the one that you would help them, you know, access vouchers so they can be, you know, transferred to permanent housing? Um, that's my uh, second question. Uh, the, other, um, the other question is that, you know, when they come to the drop-in center, um, I mean, that's when they get the referral, but for the general public, a lot of them would, you know, maybe call 311 or just to see how they can help um, this youth in need. So are those numbers uh, get tracked um, by DYCD? Mm -hmm. And so that we can have a better picture in terms of what the needs are. But I, I really want to focus on the, the, the 16 to 24, because my assumption is, I think, if they were offered, you know, a bed in a smaller facility that just catered to that age group, I think a lot of youth would welcome that rather than go in to the DHS system where they are going to be most likely in some of these larger shelter, you know, with adults and not the most appropriate place. I and mean, that's why we yeah. set aside, you know, beds for this age group. So if you can elaborate more on that in terms of how we tracking the number to show the needs, if we can track the referral that we refer to DHS, that would give us a better idea of what the needs might be. We, we, we definitely track it and local law 81 requires the um, information for the streamlining of youth from DYCD to DHS. And one of the things that we do with that streamlined process is 
as you know, DHS has three um, youth shelters, uh, Turning Point, Create Young, and Marsh's House. And when we make the necessary um, referral to DHS, we are making the referral to one of those three youth shelters first so that they could be amongst youth um, of their age. And do you so, know how many beds are? Uh, off, offhand, I do not. I would have to get that, um, that number to you, but I want to say it's over, it's probably in the 150s because I know Marsh's house alone is in the high is in the 80s I believe but I would need to um, get, get that number to you the exact number but that's how we work with DHS um, with respect to any streamlined referral is that they are referred to one of those three youth shelters um, so that they can be amongst um, youth and young people in terms of the housing vouchers yes we definitely work with our HYA sites to, to make sure that they put in the necessary um, um, applications and follow through with NYCHA on any um, issuance of uh, emergency housing voucher and or a city for HEPs um, voucher. So that is one of the, the priorities of our new housing initiatives that we have happening now. And um, Tracy, I don't know if you wanna add to the work that you've been doing around EHV and city perhaps in terms of working with the older population or just working with the youth in general. Um, if you're gonna unmute um, Ms. Tracy Thorne. Hi, hi Randy, yes. Um, thanks for the question. The, we are, we're currently having, we have a city fabs pilot that we're, um, focusing on young people who are aging out of our of, of both the 21 and 24 year old programs and the um, 20, 16 to 20 programs, um, that's a priority for us. And also we have this um, really great opportunity to offer emergency housing vouchers to the population as well. So um, right now, um, the, these resources, we're, we're working really hard to ramp up the programs I'm to sorry. get these resources. Do you have any numbers of kids uh, in the age group that you have been able to place? We have, um, there are, we have, um, because we have so many emergency housing vouchers, we're focusing on them first. And we are, we have young people with vouchers currently searching for apartments. Um, and we also have um, 12 young people with City for HEPs shopping letters who are searching for apartments. I don't have the I don't have the ages I don't have the ages in front of me though I can get back uh, to you. I that. guess uh, yeah the number of kids who were placed are, are you considering like for the kids I mean for the youth are they in terms of like roommates because yes. if they have two voucher if they can combine it you know they might be able to rent a two bedroom apartment uh, or a three bedroom apartment because that's what you know other kids are doing a uh, roommate so if if that Absolutely. could be a situation, I mean, I think that that's something that we should definitely continue to pursue. Yeah, excellent point. Yes, we are. Thank you. Yeah, if you can uh, give us some of the follow-up statistics, um, okay. that would be helpful. Yeah, I just want to add that both started um, in July. So, so we are um, just now starting to see the fruits of our labors for the past three months. Yeah, if you can kind of share the success stories with us. Absolutely. That would be great. I can't wait. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. At this time, we have concluded the first round of questions, and I will now call on Chair Rose, followed by any other council members who would like to ask a second round of questions. Please keep your questions to two minutes during this period, including the witness response. And the Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer to let you know when you are when your time is up. Chair Rose. Thank you again um, very much, uh, Amy, for moderating. Um, you know, uh, we spoke about uh, local law 79 and um, the reporting, you know, how many how important it was that the programs contributed to the report. Um, and so in 2018, seven programs reported um, were listed. Um, and in this last report, there were actually no reporting programs um, 
uh, that were referenced, although youth placement numbers were still provided? Well, the reason why there's no um, programs reported in the, the, the most recent report is because there have been zero youth who have been um, turned away. The report in 28 identifies the, the youth that were turned away and which programs they were um, that reported that. So that's why you see that information in the 2018 report and nothing in the 2021 um, and the 2020 reports. It's because no, no youth were turned away. So if there was a youth that was turned away, then those that information would have been included in the report. Um, do you classify um, a mother and child bed as a one or two? It's classified as two beds. It's two beds. Okay. Well, basically, the, the, the baby is in a bassinet, but it's still identified as two. Okay. So there's um, so mother and baby. What what's the age that you know the baby? The baby know? is newborn to five, and that's based on the state regulations. Okay. Um, so there, um, there would then be the need for an actual bed or a crib or something. Correct. Right? Or Correct. an actual bed. <laughs> uh -huh. um, uh, and um, uh, uh, did or or why why did DYCD block New York City providers from serving twenty one to twenty four year olds during the pandemic? which was permitted under the regulatory waivers issued by the Office of Children and Family Services. We actually did not do any such thing. Um, basically during the pandemic, we operated as normal with respect to how um, services are being rendered. One, our 21 to 24 um, HYA programs were still in the development stage during the pandemic. So all of them were not um, up and operational as they are now. So, and what we also did was we allowed for um, 21 year olds to be, you know, extended in programs. They did not, they were not um, discharged once they turned 21. So we gave programs who were operating HYA sites the ability to do so. Um, so I think we addressed any need that was, um, that was identified during the pandemic. And if we could not, like I said, we made the necessary, the programs needed, made the necessary referrals. Do you, um, uh, do you think that, um, oh, do you think there's a need for more LGBTQ um, beds in the system? Actually, we, we, we just awarded in a, um, the Ali Forney Center a, a new program, which is in the process of, um, we're working with them on their site to get it up and operational. So I think we're addressing all the needs. We, what we do is we look at the trends through our analysis and there's been a time when we needed more female beds. And when we did an RFP, we looked to, um, to, to make sure that that happened. And now the trend is not for LGBTQ or um, female, the trend is showing that need for more male beds. So we, um, and we have a lot of male beds currently vacant. So we're addressing the need when um, a referral is needed. So the trend is like a roller coaster. It goes up and down when we look at what the need is and through conversation with providers. And right now the trend is showing more towards males than females or LGBTQ plus. But again, oh. all of our programs are, um, serve LGBTQ plus. So if an LGBTQ plus um, young person needed a placement, they can get one. Um, so with through your um, your access, um, your um, your reporting and your um, evaluation, uh, you you said that you're going to evaluate. Um, some of the, the outcomes of the reports. Um, do you have any recommendations that you would um, make to improve the reporting and the implementation of the laws that we've talked about today? Well, based, in, on, based on your assessment of- Based on of, my assessment? Right. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that question because um, that's one of the things that we, you know, definitely look at in terms of our data um, within RHY. And we've worked with our IT department to definitely make the, um, the work easier. And as I mentioned in the, um, 
my testimony, we've done a, a lot of work so far to this date that has um, helped not only us, but our providers in terms of streamlining the information. So we definitely want to look at ways that we can enhance things. How can we work with our city sister agencies when um, information needs to be passed through and we have an MOU with them? How can we more streamline that so it can be more beneficial for our um, young person? Um, how can we now include, knowing that we have this housing initiatives, how can we use our systems to make that um, more easier in working with NYCHA or HPD or DHS or um, whoever? So yes, we definitely look at ways we can improve it. We also ask our providers, how can we make their life more easier? <laughs> um, and I, you may recall, but many years ago, we were working from paper manual reports, right? And that took time where a person had to look at the report and then put together the numbers. So to be where we are today, where all we have to do is press a button and a report pops out and we're continuing to um, develop that, I think we're in a good space and we're always going to continue to evolve as um, the city and the world evolves with respect to data. And so you'll be having conversations oh, yeah. with us. Uh, about... Oh yeah, we have weekly meetings with our IT, and we'll, um, you know, share any updates with respect to where we are in the process. And um, you know, we'll be sharing it again with our providers because they'll be the ones who will be helping us drive this, um, this, this evolution. Okay. Um, are there any other questions from any other council members? Yeah, uh, we don't have any other council member hands raised. Okay. So All right. Okay. Um, well, um, Commissioner and, <laughs> and Director Thorne, um, you know, I, I want to thank you. I, I want uh, I want to impress upon you the need for those working groups to actually be um, inclusive, comprehensive um you know with some clear goals um in mind you know uh achievable or or some of them won't be achievable based on just how government works but um some clear goals with timelines and definitely with input real input yep. structured meetings with real input from the providers and and advocates um and um and that when we do assess the data that we have, that we utilize it to bring um, forth um, budget recommendations so that we can actually um, fulfill the needs of, of whatever the programs are going forward. Um, we know the need is growing. It, unfortunately, it's not decreased. The pandemic has exposed the um, a greater need than I think anybody even anticipated. So um, I expect to see that reflected in um, not only the reports but reflected in the budget request. Um, and so uh, I want to thank you again for um, for testifying today. And uh, oh oh, I, I just wanted the the vouchers are so important. I know that you um, we're working on it. Um, you know, Steve, uh, Council Member Levin, and myself, we're we're really you know pushing to to get the legislation to ensure that every you know aging out youth has access to um, a voucher. Um, so uh, I would really like to see um, the numbers how you're how this is is working out. Um, so could you um, include me in whatever correspondence you have regarding that so um, so that we yeah. can you know see that's what, not a problem and and we and I would even extend and offer an invite for you to attend one of the um, meetings that Tracy holds with the providers so that you can see how the flow of um, discussion happens in terms of uh, moving that process along because it, it's very informative and Tracy's done a great job in, in getting the providers where they need to be. So I uh, definitely would yeah, extend Tracy, a, please, yeah. Yeah, extend the um, invitation to you to attend one of those meetings. Okay, thank you. I, I would mm -hmm. appreciate that. 
Um, and uh, I hope that you're leaving um, if you're not staying, because I know this is such a riveting, you know, hearing. Um, but I want to stay. You're so not, if, you, if you're not staying, um, I want to stay. <laughs> so if yeah. you want, do what you do, your move your powers to make sure that they keep me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Then um, I'd like you to stay so that you could hear the testimony of our advocates and providers. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I turn it back over to um, our facilitator. Thank you, Chair Rose. At this time, we have concluded the second round of questions and we'll be moving on to public testimony. We'd like to again thank the administration for their presence during this portion of the hearing and we'd appreciate their continued presence as we move on to public testimony. Um, I would like to remind everyone for public testimony that I will call up individuals in panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raised hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For public panelists, once, you're, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you a go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony is going to be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The first panel of public, the first pu panel of public panelists will be in the following order. Um, Jamie Paulovich from the Coalition of Homeless Youth, Jane Biggleson from Covenant House, and Ramon Leclerc from New Alternatives. Um, Jamie Paulovich, you may now begin your testimony. Clock is ready. Good morning. My name is Jamie Paulovich, and I'm the Executive Director of the Coalition for Homeless Youth. To clarify, the Coalition for Homeless Youth was an incorporated nonprofit that was established in 1978, and it isn't my own personal group. I would like to thank you, Chair Rose, for holding today's hearing and to the rest of the committee staff for being here and your ongoing support of youth experiencing homelessness in New York City. I'd like to start off by publicly expressing our deep gratitude to the late Councilman Lou Fiddler, who was a leader in the fight to get many of the bills that we are discussing today passed at, during his time at the Brooklyn Borough President's Office. We would be forever grateful for his commitment and leadership and also to the youth leaders that led the fight to the passage of many of the bills being discussed today. I'll be submitting longer testimony, but I'll focus my verbal testimony on Local Law 79 and Local Law 88, and I'm happy to follow up with counsel with written documentation to back up everything that I will be discussing. Regarding Local Law 79, overall, this has been the most problematic legislation in the way that DYCD has chosen to implement and report out on it. The two main reasons for this, which have already been talked about by the council, are that the numbers that are produced in the mandated reporting are not accurate as they only capture youth that are being referred by a DYCD program to another DYCD program since the onus to complete the shelter access report at the provider level is on the referring agency. Agencies that accept referrals do not complete the form. Therefore, youth that call themselves call pro programs themselves or youth that non-DYCD programs call on behalf of are not captured. The second main issue is linked to the way that DYCD captures vacancies in their PTS system. They do not break down vacancies by gender, mother, child versus single, or account for beds that have already have a youth scheduled to move in, but they have not arrived to do intake yet. Our recommendations regarding this law are one, DYCD needs to establish a working group to improve the accuracy of the shelter access report. And number two, DYCD needs to expand the shelter access report to capture all youth that are trying to get a youth shelter bed, not just those that are being referred by another DYCD runaway and homeless youth program. Regarding local law 88, um, despite passing this bill, DYCD has decided to only allow to serve 21 to 24 year olds through additional and separate funding in its implementation, which is why there are only 60 young adult beds in the continuum. This is also why it is nearly impossible to find a vacant older youth bed when a youth is in need. Even though DYCD knows that they continue to take, even though DYCD knows this, 
they continue to take drastic steps to prevent older youth from finding safety and stability within their system without valid justification. This has included. Finish, you can finish your statement. Okay. Finish. This has included threatening to take away beds from providers that have vacancies in their 16 to 21 year old programs instead of allowing them to house the 21 to 24 year olds who spend countless nights sleeping on the cots and chairs in the drop in center. Um, and as uh, chair, as you mentioned, this also allowed DYCD blocking New York City providers from housing older youth in the 16 to 21 year old shelter programs when they had vacancies during the height of the pandemic, which OCFS allowed during reg uh, through regulatory waivers. Thank you. Thank you. I tried to talk fast. <laughs> <laughs> you did a good job. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Jane Biggleson to testify. Clark's Hello, ready. everybody. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Jane Biggleson. She, her. I'm the VP of Advocacy at Covenant House New York. First, I'd like to thank Chair Rose, the entire committee, as well as committee staff, who's always especially helpful to me. Uh, for more about Covenant House, I refer you to my written testimony. I'm going to focus less on the reporting bills, but the bills that have had or the laws that have had the most effect on practice for us in very much a positive way. First, Local Law 87, which extended the time period that young people can stay with us. While it's true that for a majority of RHY, they cycle in and out of programs, so our average length of stay is far below the new law. But for some young people, they need they needed more than the 30 to 60 days of previous law, because getting ID alone often takes 60 days. So in the past year, 188 youth have stayed with us over 60 days. So if it was not for that law change, those youth would have had to left, leave, and that would have placed unnecessary obstacles in their way out of poverty. The only drawback to that law that we're seeing is the small but not insignificant number of youth who have extreme mental health or medical needs. We're lucky to have a great health clinic on site as well as a strong mental health team. But for some reason in recent years, we're seeing increases in su active suicidality, psychosis, schizophrenia, and the RHY continuum is not the best place to serve these youth. Frequently, we try to admit them into the hospital who only keeps them for a day before sending them back. So the length of stay is having these young people stay in RHY shelters for longer than they should. So we really need the city to come up with programs for youth with extreme mental health needs. Um, we're especially grateful for Local Law 88, which extended the age that allowed us to open our Bainbridge house, which has been open for seven months and that is almost always at full capacity. So we think that's um, extremely important raising that age for the movement to end youth homelessness, but 60 beds just barely scratches the surface. And that's really the program, that's the age group where we have the most turnaways. So we ask the city to put more funding toward that older age group without of course diminishing any funding from the lower age group. Not in my written testimony, but based on things that people were saying, it is true that there are less turnaways um, these days in that underage group, which is great, but we're seeing that the service needs are higher. The legal needs, the immigration needs, the mental health needs. Um, we have one attorney at Covenant House. I think we're the only RHY program with an attorney to help our young people, and he works 24-7 um, because of the immigration needs. So while the number of turnaways is much better, the need for services is very strong. Uh, I thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I will now turn or call on Ramon LeCur for his testimony. Time begins. Good afternoon. Um, I want to start by saying New Alternative sees three to five turnaways from RHY shelters per week which is very contradictory to what Mr. Scott stated. Um, we, today, we had a trans person who my director, Kate Barnhart, called uh, at a four-day four, and they told them that there was a two-week wait list, a waiting period before they can enter the system. Also, I find it very, very disturbing that Mr. Scott feels that 
that the that DHS is a safe and appropriate alternative to a smaller age age inclusive program that DYCD can um, have if they were willing to. Mr. Scott stated that they are afraid to house the 16 to 20 and with 21 to 24 because of impressionability. Also, the same should go for that 24 to one to four, 21 to 24 year olds with the impressionability of being in the adult system. Young people are still impressionable. So I don't understand why DYCD has this. Hip, hypocritic lens on. They want to protect their 16 to 20 year olds, but they don't care about the impressionability of the 21 to 24 year old when it comes to the adult system. I really think we're my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Chair Rose, if you have any questions for this group of panelists. Um, I. My question was, you know, how they might see how they might we might improve the sheltering access reporting or improve the reporting and implementation of the laws that we focused on today. But um, many of them already addressed it. If, if there's anything additional that you would like to say um, in regard to how we might improve any of these reporting bills. Um, or if there's a particular um, group that you think um, we need to provide additional beds, like uh, you know, 24, 21 to 24, LGBTQ, mother child, you know, if any of any of the panelists would like to uh, say anything additional on those yeah. two issues. Yeah, I, I think there's a severe need to. Um, provide more beds for 21 to 24 and LGBTQ specific. Um, Thank you. And in, and, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more thing I need to address, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, um, it's not fair to also place foster youth aging out from 21 to 24 into the adult system. But unfortunately, that's what happened to me and I wasn't really prepared, but I mean, I think I turned out okay for it though. On how to use coping mechanisms, but yeah, th this is also something that we need to be really aware of, and we really need DYCD's support on, because more people are aging out of foster care and ending up either street homeless or in the shelter system. Thank you. That's an excellent remark. We are we are working on that, you know, as we speak. Um, so uh, it's important that foster young people who are, are uh, getting out of the foster care system, you know, have appropriate housing and, and resources. Um, so thank you. Thank you all. Um, moderator, um, the next panel. Oh, I believe we have an additional comment by um, Oh, James. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, and, and Council Member Chin also wants to ask a question. I'm sorry. But, um, Jamie? Okay, I wasn't sure if I should go. I think um, definitely need more 21 to 24 year old beds. And again, I can't emphasize enough the need for a working group around the shelter access report. It's been something that providers um, have been requesting for years now. And I think uh, in addition to a specific question that Councilwoman Chin asked regarding the tracking of the DYCD to DHS referral numbers, you can see on the reports themselves, it does not um, differentiate between age. And so I think building out an intentional column that captures the amount of 18 to 20 year olds that are referred through that process and then 21 to 24 year olds again to try to get a more comprehensive picture of how many additional older youth beds we need. And then I think lastly, similar to what Jane testified to from Covenant House, the runaway and homeless youth system is desperate 
for mental health specific supports. Um, today was the first time I've ever heard of mental health hubs in the drop-in centers. Um, and they sound very exciting and, and I can't wait to learn more. But I think in addition to robust services at the drop-in centers, we also need to explore mental health specific shelters for youth um, the same way that they have them in DHS. Thank you. Thank you for your response. Council Member Chin. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, thank you for your testimony. And I, you know, from what you're saying, I think that we definitely need to have more beds for for the uh, the older youth. You know, the the 21 to 24, 60 is definitely not enough. And I know that you know we started advocating for it, but we need to you know continue to do that. And that's what I was asking. Uh, and hopefully, we could follow up with DYCD because the youth that they refer over to DHS, that should be counted as youth that would turn away from DYCD beds. Um, and, and that would make sense. And that they would know how many more beds are needed for this population from 18 to 24 that was turned over um, to DHS. Uh, the other question that I wanted to ask is that the provider, have you have any experience in terms of using the vouchers and do roommate situation where, um, you know, where individuals can share in an apartment, two bedroom or three bedroom apartment, have any of you have experience or successful experience placing um, clients in, in those uh, roommate situations? I find in my work that Having finding people to accept the vouchers is still very, very difficult. People are given vouchers, but they're still having a hard time finding a landlord who's willing to take them. It don't matter if it's one person, two people, three people. It seems like these landlords still don't want to accept them. Or I don't know if there's still a distrust with the city from the advantage program. That's why they're reluctant to take this program. So for what the issue is, but there's still a severe issue. And I know that there's work being done to curtail the denials, but it's still very overwhelming. Thank you. I believe Jane Bagelson would also like to respond to this question. Yes, we we do place youth in apartments with, with vouchers, but I can't express enough how important these city vouchers are. There's a pilot project now with 50 vouchers. I think each agency gets 10 and we've had over 40 youth apply. So that means 30 of our young people aren't going to get it. And it's when our young people do everything right, they are in a TIL program, they go to school, they save money. If they don't have a voucher, affordable housing in New York City is impossible. So we're really hoping that this pilot project results in our young people should have the same access to those vouchers as people in the DHS shelter system. I mean, it really doesn't make sense that because they're at a DYCD funded system as opposed to DHS, mm -hmm. that they have limited access to these vouchers. Yeah, I guess with the vouchers is that, that that's what I'm really looking at this whole roommate situation because I see the general population you know, a lot of even our council staff, they share apartments. And wow. if it's a two bedroom, three bedroom apartment, mm -hmm. uh, we should be able to place these youth in this, in these apartments. And if the landlords are not open uh, to that, or, I mean, then we should think of legislatively, how do we get, you know, some of these development that has tax abatement and, and government subsidy uh, mm -hmm. to open up? Because you know there are larger market rate apartments, so if we could team up the youth, I mean that, that's a, that could be you know permanent housing for them. So I think we we should all you know together with the advocates, let's work together and see how we can make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move on to our next panel, I see that Jamie Pavlovich would also like to respond to this question. Thank you. And just in response to what you were asking, Councilwoman Chin. My understanding is, well, there's two different kinds of vouchers right now for runaway and homeless youth. There's the emergency housing vouchers that are connected to COVID relief from the federal government that are tenant-based Section 8 vouchers. And then there's the 50 city FEPS voucher pilot for DYCD. Um, 
my understanding for most vouchers is that you can't co-locate them so that you can't use two vouchers towards one apartment. That's not unique to the youth vouchers, that's across the board. The only scenario where you can use more than one voucher in an individual apartment is in situations where landlords um, choose to lease rooms in an apartment and not the entire apartment as, as one, um, one location. And so I think that that's much larger advocacy that needs to happen, not just for young people, but for all individuals experiencing homelessness that are getting these vouchers, because I think what you're saying is absolutely correct. We're finding a lot of vacancies in the two, three, four bedroom apartments and the one bedroom apartments rents are too high for the vouchers to be utilized. Um, and I think, unfortunately, though, there's limitations around how you can use more than one um, for one apartment. I'm expecting. Thank you for your testimony. Um, seeing no further questions, we will now turn to our next group of panelists. Um, I will now be called, the next panelist will be in the following order. Maddox Gorilla from the Coalition for Homeless Youth and Lyndon Hernandez from New York City Youth Action Board. Um, Maddox Gorilla, you may now begin your testimony. Mark is ready. Uh, hi everyone, thank you. My name is Maddox Gorilla and I am the coordinator of the New York City Youth Action Board, which is the body of young people with lived experience of homelessness that informs the work of the New York City Continuum of Care. I'm here today since the YAB was one of the leaders in the fight to get many of these bills passed. I'm going to limit my testimony to the implementation of law, local law 88 with increased up upper age limit for eligibility of youth to access runaway homeless youth programs from 21 to 25 year olds. Um, as has been addressed today, I mean, again, like everything that's already been brought up, you know, and the problem with the 21 to 25 year olds during the pandemic, we know that um, we were doing the daily updates with the coalition and YAB, and that was not reflected. N no day was there ever beds. Any of those beds were not available for 21 to 25 year olds. We also know that youth do not want to be in DHS shelters. Most times youth prefer to be on the street than to be in DHS shelters. So referring folks to DHS is, you know, people mention it's not um, what we want. And also, um, we know that DYCD just isn't implementing. The, they're not advocating for 21 to 25 year olds how they are. And actually what I'm interested in you all exploring and asking them about is, I, I, Randy mentioned the use of the Unity Project to give resources to LG, LGBTQ youth. And I wanna know if there's any data on how those, those programs are being implemented because for me on the ground, I mean, just, almost two months ago, I, I had heard that that program hadn't even been implemented yet fully. So I would encourage you all to please follow up on data for that in regards to LGBTQ youth. And I mean, everything that's been said, I know Randy said that it's, it was absurd to hear that he didn't block providers, but they did, they did block for providers. We know that OCFS allowed for DYCD to expand their bed capacity and they chose to not. And we also know that they had a very delayed response to giving a uniform COVID response to providers. So I'm disappointed again, and I will just say that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Lyndon Hernandez to testify. Mark is ready. Good morning, my name is Lyndon Hernandez. I, I'm a member of the New York City Youth Action Board. Thank you for holding this important hearing and giving me the opportunity to testify. As you may already know, the Youth Action Board was a leader in the advocacy that led to the creation and passing of the number of bills that you are talking about today. I'll be focusing my testimony on Local Law 88 and Local Law 87. I fully support Local Law 88, which increases the age that you can stay in a DYCD from 21 to 24 years old. By extending the age, you give the youth more time to develop a more sustainable career path, and it gives them more time to work through the trauma attached to their lived experience of homelessness and to develop skills and strategies to develop independence. 
while looking to obtain sustainable permanent housing. While being provided access to RHY programs, I recommend that BYCD fund more beds for youth 21 to 24 so that everyone that needs one can have access to that service. I fully support Local Law 87, which extends the periods of time a youth can remain and run away in homeless youth shelters. I support the law due to youth being at harm if referred to DHS facilities and the trauma that underlies new transitions from one unstable housing to another. And also instead of streamlining individuals to DHS to find solutions to provide more permanent housing options to youth residing in DYCD facilities. I think that by giving youth more time, Local Law 87 has helped a lot of youth experiencing homelessness, gather the tools and resources that they need in order to exceed and success. I thank you, Chair, and I thank you, Council, for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Chair. If you have any questions for the panel. Um, I would just like to thank um, both Maddox and Lyndon for, um, for the time and effort that they put on the New York City Action Board. Um, and I want to ask you, do you feel that your voices are being heard? Do you feel that, um, you know, um, that you are getting results from, uh, from the input that you bring to the meetings? Either one of you or both of you can answer, Lyndon or Maddox. There we go. We were unmu unmuted. Um, I, I, I don't, in regards to DYCD, I don't because I, I feel like they, they're not honest. They come on here and say something. And, and even honestly, every time, I, you know, y'all make an effort to push back. I will say, I do see, you know, you, um, y'all have brought the questions to, to dig deeper. I just feel like they always have a response. They don't listen enough. He, too much talking, not enough quiet, taking feedback. And I feel like, I don't know if how y'all could push on that, but I think that that's what needs to happen. And, um, you know, in order for, for any culture to be essential, we need to have a healthy feedback culture. And if people are not okay with receiving feedback and have a comment to quickly fix, oh, no, no, we got this going all right. I don't think, I, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like that's really the problem. I don't think that they, they listen. I feel like they're just always trying to cover their bases, but they don't listen to, to the feedback we're giving. Thank you. Lyndon, do you want to comment? I agree with um, Maddox's statement. Um, I just believe that the collaboration between BYCD and the New York City Youth Action Board and youth in general could be worked on. Not to say that it's not progress because progress has been made. We have seen certain accomplishments that we have done over the years, but at the end of the day, collaboration is essential to the work that we provide and the services that we're doing. So in order for our youth voices to be heard, it has to be looked upon that youth voices need to be present in the room. We need to have more youth collaboration, more youth involvement. The way that we're speaking should be looked upon as professionals as well, because we are the ones who are coming with the experience. We are coming with the lived experience, the trauma. We experience the day-to-day -day things that we encounter, and we would just like more being done. So we are here for that, and we are here to advocate for the needs of the youth that we serve, and this is our mission, and collaboratively, me and Maddox are very passionate about the things that we do. And we look to go on and on until our voices are heard, until the things that we need are being heard, until they're being, changes are actually being made. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chair Rose, do you have any further questions? Or also Council Member oh. Chen, if you have any further questions? Council Member Chen, okay. Um, I just, I, I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody who, who testified today, um, who uh, took their time to, to provide thoughtful testimony. Um, I am working really hard to make this a process where, um, where the feedback 
is um, is heard and um, and taken back and worked on. Um, I'm going to continue because um, I I feel that um, all of the points that were made by our uh, our panelists were valuable and are definitely issues that we need to look into and um, and have DYCD address. So um, I, I wanna first thank you. I wanna thank DYCD for, um, for uh, pro producing the reports in a, in a timely manner and, um, and for coming before us to, to discuss them. Um, but we, uh, we do have some issues that we have to resolve and uh, we're gonna follow up. So uh, I thank everybody for being a part of it. Um, I, I thank our council staff for the hard work that they put into um, making sure that the committee's informed and that this um, hearing went well, as well as all of the sergeants at arms that made sure that this, this hearing went well without a glitch. Um, it was really nice. Nobody froze and we weren't hacked or uh, any problems. Um, so uh, with that, I just want to wish everybody stay safe. Um, and uh, with that, this meeting is adjourned at 3.02 p.m.